Good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, New America Foundation. I'm Peter Bergen. I run the National Security Studies Program. We're um, really, really thrilled that uh, Ben Emerson, the Special Rapporteur for the United Nations uh, for Human Rights and Countering Terrorism, has agreed to uh, give uh, a public talk here about the work that he's been doing and um, how he's progressing on uh, what will be a, a, a public report uh, likely produced in October in some form. Uh, Mr. Emerson's had a distinguished career. He took up his present post in August of 2011. Uh, he's been, a, previous to that, a practicing barrister in London for the, with more than 25 years of experience in domestic and international human rights law, international human humanitarian law, and international criminal law. He's litigated extensively in UK courts, the Euro European Court of Human Rights, the International Court of Justice, and the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslav Yugoslavia published widely, lectured widely. He's the editor of a number of practitioners manuals on criminal and human rights law. And uh, he's kindly agreed to speak for about half an hour. Um, and then I'll engage him in Q&A and then throw it open to you uh, to ask questions. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, um, <coughs> thank you very much indeed, both for the invitation and the introduction. And thanks to the New America Foundation for uh, uh, setting up this event. It's part of a, a conversation um, that I am having uh, through the mandate and the inquiry that I'm engaged with, but actually a much larger conversation um, uh, about where we are and where we should be going in establishing uh, a longer term sustainable and, and ethical counterterrorism strategy which tackles not just the manifestations of terrorism uh, from a security point of view, uh, but also some of the root causes. Um, I, I just say a little bit about where I'm coming from, and then I'll talk a bit more about the, uh, the issue of drones. Um, uh, as, uh, as Peter said in the introduction, uh, I've spent most of my life uh, as a practitioner rather than an academic, working in the fields of national security, counterterrorism, uh, and armed conflict. Uh, and I think uh, I'm learning um, more and more in the role that I presently occupy, uh, that as a practitioner, um, I do approach things rather differently from the way in which uh, academics tend to approach some of the thornier questions of international law. Um, and in particular, I don't really believe in the existence of law as an independent thing but rather as ideas and principles that people establish in order to regulate situations of fact. Uh, and most often in the work that I've done, um, one has been encountering uh, very dramatic changes uh, in uh, some of the basic paradigms of security um, with, a, uh, 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 with, a, with the law effectively playing a game of catch up. And I don't think that the drone uh, dilemma, if I can call it that, is, is, is any different in that sense. Um, I, when I took the mandate, um, made it very clear from the outset, indeed in my first speech to the General Assembly and in my first report um, uh, to the Human Rights Council, that I um, intended to ensure uh, that a mandate which was clearly originally set up to deal with excesses uh, in the so-called war on terror um, uh, was uh, a mandate that I interpreted rather more broadly. It's a mandate, uh, 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 the title of which is the protection and promotion of human rights whilst countering terrorism. Uh, and it always seemed to me uh, that one couldn't really start to talk about human rights in the context of terrorism uh, without first recognizing that the core human rights at issue uh, include the rights of the victims and potential future victims of terrorism to be protected against a terrorist attack. Uh, and I don't think that one can really begin an effective dialogue with those who have the responsibility for safeguarding the lives of their citizens and those within their jurisdiction until one recognizes from the outset the enormity uh, and primacy of that responsibility. Uh, a responsibility which, in my judgment, is a human rights obligation. It is the first human rights obligation of states to protect their citizens and those within their jurisdiction, and therefore to have in place effective counter-terrorism strategies that mitigate that risk to the extent possible. 
Um, and, and on one view, that's more than just another human rights obligation. Um, on one view, that is the reason for having states in the first place. The raison d'etre for statehood uh, is collective security. Uh, and we're not talking here about security on a macro level, but the security, the right of individuals within their state to hold their state accountable uh, where there has been a, a failure of policy uh, that has exposed them to a greater risk than otherwise they would have been exposed to. Now, in saying that, I shouldn't be taken to suggest that, that that involves any pulling of punches or any suspension of critical scrutiny where there have been recorded and systematic human rights violations committed by states in countering terrorism. That is a central concern, the central concern of the mandate. But I don't see the two as being in any sense inconsistent or incompatible or even uh, as being considerations to weigh the one against the other. On the contrary, uh, it has always been my position in interpreting this mandate that the two march hand in hand uh, and that they are directed at achieving the same goal. Let me give you a couple of concrete examples. Um, in uh, developing the uh, framework principles that I set out to the Human Rights Council when I first, in my first report, designed to promote uh, and protect the human rights of victims and potential future victims of terrorism. Uh, I consulted very, very widely with the now uh, large number of international organized groups representing the interests of victims of terrorism. Uh, and uh, almost with one voice, I mean there are exceptions, but almost with one voice, they share a common agenda about promotion of the rule of law and democracy. From their point of view, uh, whilst traditionally um, we have seen, for example, the right to a fair trial before a public court in an independent and impartial proceeding in circumstances where the evidence is reliable and hasn't been obtained by torture, uh, where the proceedings are open to the public, th those are rights that in traditional legal and political theory are thought of as rights that vest in the individual accused person. Um, but they are also rights that vest in the victims of terrorism uh, and they have, many of these groups, thought very deeply about what those rights mean. Uh, they regard, for example, the right to truth, the right to public accountability as axiomatic, as being right at the very forefront of their campaign. So that secret detention or detention without trial or detention in conditions where individuals don't receive a fair trial or situations where individuals can receive convictions, even capital convictions, on the basis of evidence that may be tainted by torture and therefore be unreliable, to be antithetical to the very values for which they stand. Uh, and so from their point of view, the right to truth involves the right to see the real perpetrator identified and brought to account in real public proceedings uh, that are fairly tried um, without tainted evidence before an independent and impartial tribunal within a reasonable time. So in a very real and practical sense, not a theoretical one, the rights of the victim and the rights of the accused person lead us to very much the same conclusion, which is a recommitment to, uh, to our adherence to the rule of law. Uh, that, for me, carries with it implications um, uh, for every aspect of my work. So, for example, and we'll talk about the, 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 the specifics in a little more detail uh, in a few moments, <clears throat> but when I approach uh, the development of a strategy such as uh, the proliferation of drone technology and targeted killing, I'm not simply looking at the narrow question, does this involve a violation of the human rights of people whose lives are lost as a result of the uh, use of targeted killing strategies, whether they be uh, targeted individuals or um, uh, civilian casualties. I'm also looking at whether in the longer run, strategies of that kind make a nation safer or less safe. In other words, I'm looking at, at the question uh, for uh, um, years and possibly decades to come of whether short-term victories can prolong longer-term conflicts. Uh, and it's within the rubric of, of that uh, analysis, if you like, looking at the um, human rights, humanitarian uh, implications of particular counterterrorism strategies from both ends of the telescope that I have uh, approached each part uh, of my work. 
So um, when dealing with uh, the increasing calls for, for example, accountability in relation to the um, Bush era CIA's policy of uh, uh, arbitrary detention and torture, um, uh, uh, the, the, the central um, basis of the thesis that I put forward to the Human Rights Council is that in a world where there are an increasing number of fragile states, uh, in a world where uh, emerging democracies need all of the encouragement they can get in order to ensure that they move forward uh, with commitment to the rule of law, the maintenance and continuing maintenance of a blind eye policy which shields from accountability individuals who've engaged in an international criminal conspiracy does nothing uh, to promote uh, respect for the rule of law and that we need in, in, to account uh, for the past before uh, setting down a solid framework for the future. Um, but the world has seen since the atrocity and crime against humanity that was committed on September the 11th, a decade or more of exceptionalism. Uh, by that I mean uh, a decade or more of legal and political philosophy which has treated established legal norms uh, as being an impediment to effective security. Uh, as requiring suspension of existing legal frameworks, uh, as requiring derogation from international human rights obligations, um, uh, as, re as requiring and having brought about a paradigm shift. And it's entirely understandable why that should be. I, I for my part, have absolutely no difficulty whatsoever in understanding why the people of the United States consider themselves to have been the victim of an act of war on 9-11. Uh, I have to tell you, that is not a view that is shared um, by and large with the international legal community uh, in certain other parts of the world who regard uh, counter-terrorism operations as being critically law enforcement operations, not justifying a war paradigm or resort to the principles governing the law of war. Uh, and that is an important part of the conversation um, uh, the dialogue that needs now to take place in relation to um, a, a future framework for, uh, uh, um, for the use and deployment of drones. Um, but I, as I say, I personally have no difficulty at all in seeing why that felt and looked like, and in many respects was uh, an act, a direct act of war on the people of the United States. Um, uh, but we are now facing a very practical and very real dilemma uh, that results from that. Um, during that 10-year period, um, I, th I think it's probably largely fair to say that the core Al-Qaeda leadership, as it was within Afghanistan uh, at the time, has been substantially destroyed. Um, uh, whilst there remain remnants of the original organization, uh, the essential command uh, uh, infrastructure has gone. Um, but in its place, we have found ourselves with a proliferation, a hydra-headed proliferation of organizations um, from the Middle East to North Africa and as far south as Uganda, um, some of them pledging allegiance to Al-Qaeda with Al-Qaeda Central not accepting their position, uh, others pledging allegiance and placing the words Al-Qaeda before their name in order to uh, identify themselves as part of a global jihad and therefore increase their appeal. Uh, with uh, the development of social media leading to a huge degree of fluidity and political change in societies which hitherto had been held together by the absence of free flow of information and ideas. Uh, with the result uh, that genuine political disputes genuine local uh, long-running conflicts uh, have in many uh, parts of the world uh, found the, uh, the, that uh, um, those with a, an essentially r radical uh, Islamist, uh, extremist uh, and politically violent agenda have adhered themselves to what were essentially secular political movements. Uh, and we've seen that with the result that what has been described um, in my view, wholly inaptly as the Arab Spring or the resurgence of democracy throughout the Arab world, um, has resulted in many uh, parts of the world in those which tend towards that end of the agenda, uh, um, uh, finding themselves with a disproportionately lo um, a, a powerful position uh, as a result. And we see now with the 
uh, West with the United Kingdom uh, and uh, parts of Europe as well as the United States poised in the dilemma as to whether or not to provide assistance to the rebel groups in Syria, um, this, this, um, uh, uh, this state of affairs really coming into um, a, 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 a situation of acute concern. I mean, what, what, what we, I, I've been spending some time over the past year working with the authorities in Iraq trying uh, to assist them in their efforts to develop an integrated strategy for uh, uh, um, uh, focusing on the Shia Sunni conflict and trying to find ways now, finally and belatedly, uh, of uh, some form of meaningful cross-sectarian peace initiatives. And for them, the notion that the West that invaded Iraq in 2003 displaced the Sunni um, a, a, a ruling class uh, and created a, a society which has then suffered from a decade of cross-sectarian slaughter uh, should now be poised in order to provide economic and military assistance uh, to a movement which includes a significant element of uh, al-Qaeda related fighters who themselves are directly related to al-Qaeda in Iraq and are causing massive security problems right across the border is an incomprehensible state of affairs. And so from my point of view, I try to look at some of these questions within the context of how we might move forward um, in a constructive form of dialogue to set some basic rules and parameters. And right now, one of the biggest threats uh, to not so much to life and limb, but to the international architecture of um, uh, humanitarian law, the law that is designed to protect civilian life uh, in times of conflict, is a combination of the proliferation of drone technology uh, and the absence of consensus about even the fundamentals that govern its deployment. Um, when I launched this inquiry in January uh, of this year, I did so in response to a call uh, that was made directly to me by a number of states uh, during the course of a dialogue at the Human Rights Council in Geneva, uh, including two members of the Security Council. Um, uh, and uh, I launched it uh, with what I thought at least was a genuinely open mind. Um, uh, I, I launched it not as an inquiry which is directed towards American foreign policy, um, but as an inquiry which is directed towards understanding the legal framework uh, that governs both the deployment of this new technology and the issues of accountability that go with that, by which I mean questions of distinguishing between civilians and combatants, uh, questions uh, of uh, ensuring that those distinctions are properly recognized and that after the event there is a proper system for determining whether or not uh, 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 there has been an unacceptably high level of civ civilian casualties, and the broader questions of the impact that that type of um, counter-terrorism initiative is likely to have uh, on uh, radicalization and the creation of future generations of, of um, uh, of jihadists. Um, but I realized as, it, as the inquiry started to get going that I had within my own approach a prejudice that I had never really examined, namely the one that comes from not being a United States citizen. Um, in, in this country, uh, I, I, I think it, it seems, I, I mean, there, there are exceptions to this principle, but there, are, uh, there seems to be a very large degree of consensus amongst the legal uh, and academic community uh, that the basic principle uh, uh, that the United States is engaged in a non-international armed conflict, a war in other words with Al-Qaeda and its associated belligerent forces, is, uh, if you like, an article of faith, matched only in its strength by the article of faith to the opposite effect uh, in Europe and elsewhere in the world, namely that this is not uh, that the fight against terrorism is not one which can be won within a war framework, within a, a humanitarian law framework, within an analysis that says uh, that the law of armed conflict is applicable, uh, but rather one which must always be tackled as a rule of law question. In other words, as a law enforcement issue, recognizing that terrorism is a terrible crime, a crime of enormous magnitude, but that we don't dignify it by creating the, the notion uh, that it has the validity of uh, being an act committed by a party to an armed conflict. That, that is a view which, like it or not, is deeply, deeply bedded, not only in the European psyche, um, uh, but I think it's fair to say in the consensus view of international lawyers in most parts of the world other than this country. Uh, and it's a problem which didn't really matter terribly much until uh, uh, um, um, in, in, the, in the first term administration in any area except 
the pursuit of the drone strategy. Because in certain parts of the world at least, not I think in Afghanistan, uh, but certainly in Waziristan, it is, it's critical to the United States justification for the policy that it is engaged in a non-international armed conflict with Al-Qaeda and its associated forces. Uh, and whilst um, uh, there is no universal consensus that that is the case, whilst uh, those in Europe are arguing to the contrary, and I mean not just libertarian groups, not just NGOs, but advisors to government of the United States' closest allies, uh, take the view that outside a recognized theater of conflict such as Afghanistan, the law of war does not apply. Now, if the law of war does not apply, then it is unlawful to target an individual in a non-belligerent state, which is why no other European state is claiming a similar justification or a similar right um, uh, 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 um, uh, as is claimed by the United States. Their analysis is that uh, outside recognized territorial theaters of conflict um, uh, it is unlawful to target an individual unless you can show that that, that that is strictly necessary in the individual case because there is a genuinely imminent threat to life. Um, so we are in a situation where a particular form of technology is proliferating where already um, the United States, the United Kingdom and Israel have been using it but um, a, a large number of other states are either in the process of seeking to acquire um, combat uh, um, UAVs or are in the process of seeking to develop their own combat UAVs. And within a relatively short time, and I, and I think you know, people say uh, within a matter of, of, of certainly a year or two, other states will be deploying the technology, and within five years or so, we will see large numbers of states and possibly non-state actors um, deploying uh, similar uh, types of, 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 um, uh, of conflict technology. Uh, and that raises some very real questions. Uh, if that is the position, then how can we expect the law to um, protect life if there is no basic consensus as to what the legal framework ought to be? Uh, and so far, I'm bound to say that having sat through far, far, far more seminars of extremely intelligent, extremely reasonable and educated people uh, at the very top end of international uh, humanitarian law and listened to their points of view, um, that there is really no um, critical mass of agreement amongst them as to how to uh, an analyze the uh, challenges that that throws up. I mean, I think we can probably all agree uh, that the United States has been the market leader in the use of this technology, and particularly its use um, uh, on the territory, of course, of other states. And, and I'm not here referring to drones in their more general sense as a surveillance technique, which is capable of many, many beneficial civilian uses. Um, capable of, of whatever the concerns are of, of, about privacy, but capable of assisting, for example, in dealing with uh, um, humanitarian relief and its delivery, in seeing large number, uh, monitoring um, internal and external population displacement, in anticipating and monitoring uh, natural disaster management, and so on and so forth. Nobody is suggesting that there is anything inherently wrong in the use of drones. Drones are not even a weapon, they're a delivery system. Um, but what we do know is that because uh, they are relatively cheap in terms of risk to the lives of the states that deploy them in conflict situations, um, uh, there is a belief uh, that uh, they are likely to result in a more generous use of armed force than would otherwise be the case. Uh, at the same time, there is very clear evidence uh, that the deployment of drones, either as a method of delivery of ordnance or as a method of identifying targets so that uh, weapons can be delivered from fixed wing aircraft, uh, are in fact considerably greater, uh, involving in fact considerably greater specificity uh, and a much lower risk of civilian damage than would be the case um, from the delivery of fixed wing uh, of ordnance from fixed wing aircraft alone. Um, within Afghanistan, for example, the United Nations mission in Afghanistan keeps detailed statistics uh, recording the number of civilian casualties uh, resulting from armed engagements. 
uh, and they do so in a manner which, to a very large degree, um, is able to distinguish between the manner in which um, uh, particular attacks have been um, carried out. Uh, and the evidence is completely clear uh, that the number of civilian casualties from, uh, 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 um, uh, fr from uh, attacks that have been delivered with the use of drones is significantly less uh, than the number of civilian casualties that result from, the, from attacks that are delivered from fixed-wing aircraft. And there is a very obvious reason for that. Um, the critical decision that has to be made uh, when, um, uh, uh, when an attack is being planned and executed is the distinction between civilians and combatants and a, a proper and accurate assessment of proportionality. Uh, that, of course, requires information. Uh, and because a drone is capable of hovering and remaining in an area for a considerable period of time, it is in a position to assimilate much greater amount of information and therefore to make more accurate and reliable decisions. Uh, I think, though there are those who argue to the contrary, that, uh, um, uh, 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 that technological analysis is borne out by the statistics. But equally, the perception on the ground in Afghanistan is the reverse. The perception on the ground is that drones are responsible for vast numbers of civilian casualties, uh, that drones are the principal cause of civilian casualties in Afghanistan, um, uh, and that they are effectively unleash indiscriminate weapons uh, on a civilian population. Now, my task in pursuing this inquiry, um, uh, and maybe inquiries looking less and less like the right, um, uh, uh, the right epithet, maybe it's more a process of dialogue, but my task is in exploding some of the myths, but at the same time getting accurately to the truth about the civilian casualties that have happened in order uh, to bring everybody to the table, both in terms of an agreement as to the basic legal principles, but also in terms of far, far greater transparency uh, and accountability where things have gone wrong. The plain fact is you cannot wage any conflict without making mistakes. The fact that individual civilian casualties have occurred is not necessarily uh, evidence that there has been a significant system failure or and certainly not evidence that there has been uh, a war crime. On the other hand, it could be. Uh, and by um, uh, uh, allowing a, a shroud of complete secrecy to have descended over a strategy that involves the taking of life, so that at neither end, neither the sending end nor the receiving end, is there currently accurate and reliable data about the extent, nature, and frequency of civilian casualties. Uh, the territory is wide open for those who want to um, make either claims that minimize the risks, claims that minimize the extent of civilian casualties, and certainly some of the whisperings that have come out of, um, uh, 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 out of uh, 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 Washington that suggest that civilian casualties are in single figures are regarded as uh, being utterly without credibility, even by the most senior diplomats of the United States' closest allies within Pakistan. At the other end of the extreme, um, uh, there are those, I think undoubtedly, who have made exaggerated claims of civilian damage. Uh, and I think there's a very real danger in both. Uh, the danger of exaggerated claims is that it contributes to radicalization and makes the development of a sustainable uh, ethical counterterrorism strategy almost impossible. Um, the danger of a, a combination of secrecy and underestimating civilian damage is that it enables uh, the ter leaves the territory wide open for those claims to be made. So the two essential twin tasks that I'm engaged upon is to try to promote some sort of sensible discussion between two polar opposite positions as to the basic legal framework with a recognition, and as I say, I think there's nobody within the administration here who doesn't now recognize this, that whatever framework emerges from this as the United States justification and the discipline and limits on the use of force on the territory of another state without its consent in order to pursue uh, um, a, a combatance um, <clears throat> from a non-state, from a terrorist organization, it has to be a framework which we are willing to see applied by those states that we are not on friendly terms with. In other words, it has to be a framework 
that we can live with if it is being used by Iran when it is deploying drones against Iranian dissidents hiding inside the territory of Syria or Turkey or Iran. Iraq. It has to be a framework we're prepared to see China use against uh, dissident groups from Tibet or uh, that, we, that we're prepared to see um, armed groups use in conflicts that um, we are inevitably going to encounter. Um, uh, over the uh, coming years. In other words, it has to be a framework that can sustain uh, and stand the test of time. Now, <clears throat> the reality is that, that there are almost certainly, and the preliminary indications um, seem so far to confirm this, greater safeguards built into the way in which the program has been operated, certainly in, in, in the very most recent times, um, uh, than people are generally aware of. But I think uh, there is now an understanding um, within Washington of the absolute necessity to engage in a debate with a view to agreeing some basic international principles which discipline the use of this technology. It's not going away. Um, drones are here to stay. Their military logic is unanswerable. Therefore, they will become a part of the regular um, a, 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 a regular feature, a fixed feature, and a growing one um, of the way in which conflicts are conducted. Uh, there is not going to be in the future the monopoly that has existed over the past few years on the use of drone technology in the hands of the United States. It is a very real situation that we are facing and facing imminently. And indeed, <clears throat> those who advise me in the area of weapons technology uh, sometimes make the joke that I may as well be doing a report on bows and arrows because by the time it comes out, they will have moved on to the next generation, which are capable of making, I mean, we know they're capable of making kill decisions, but at the moment, nobody is suggesting uh, ethically that it would, it would be acceptable to delegate to a machine the decision to take a human life. But there are many, many shades in between. For example, allowing a machine to override a decision uh, uh, to uh, launch a missile because it is capable of detecting risks that a human being is incapable of detecting, building into the systems um, opportunities for them to uh, um, uh, protect themselves against attack. Um, there are many, many uh, shades of development and the reality is that as with many other areas in the past, the law, as I said at the outset, often struggles to catch up with the facts. Uh, <clears throat> some uh, uh, of those who, who are enthusiastic proponents of um, a, a progressive development in the legal framework refer to the days when um, <coughs> bombs were first dropped from uh, air balloons during the course of armed conflicts, which was regarded at the time as being unethical uh, and um, uh, unlawful. Unethical and unlawful because it was a remote delivery of death. It didn't involve putting your troops in arms way. Um, it, it, it was capable of inflicting indiscriminate civilian damage. Um, the reality is these weapons do not um, carry with them the inevitable risk of inflicting indiscriminate civilian damage. Uh, they are more precise uh, than, uh, and more capable of distinction uh, than fixed-wing aircraft delivering precisely the same ordnance. However, the problem comes when we are deciding who is a legitimate target and who is not. In other words, the risk of killing civilians comes in when the choice is being made about how individuals are to be targeted. It's one thing to have a small list of high-ranking pre-identified individuals and set out to eliminate them. Um, but the reality is that, that um, the evidence suggests that that is not the way in which the strategy has been pursued. Uh, and therefore, all depends on the quality of the decision-making uh, uh, um, process uh, in identifying who is and who is not a legitimate military target if we're looking at this through the paradigm uh, of the law of war. And I'm afraid I, can't, I, I, I find myself drawing an analogy in my own mind um, between the identification of an individual or group of people uh, as being associated with Al-Qaeda for the purposes of um, uh, being legitimate targets on a military kill list and precisely the same question as it is posed by the United Nations Security Council when deciding whether an individual or entity should be included in the United Nations Al-Qaeda sanctions list, a list maintained 
um, uh, 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 <coughs> since Resolution 1267 of individuals who are thought to have provided material support or otherwise be associated with Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or its uh, affiliate and co-belligerent organizations. At present, there are 230 individuals on that list. Uh, the list is created by nomination by states on the basis of their intelligence assessments. The United States is uh, probably the highest and certainly amongst the highest of, no of the nominators to that list, but the list can include individuals nominated by any state. Uh, and there has never been a very satisfactory mechanism for deciding whether an individual should be included within the list. But two years ago, um, uh, the UN or the Security Council was persuaded to appoint an ombudsperson to consider individuals and entities' applications for removal from the list. And in the first 30 cases that the ombudsperson considered, and 30 out of 230, so a significant number, uh, resulted in a 90% um, uh, error rate. In other words, 90% of the applications considered resulted in the individual or entity being delisted. Now, that doesn't mean to say they shouldn't have been on the list in the first place, but it does mean to say that at the time when they remained on the list, they were no longer considered objectively and reasonably to represent a present threat or to be part of or associated with Al-Qaeda as it now exists. Well, if that is the position with the United Nations Security Council list, uh, I, I think we're entitled to ask, what is it about the lists that are compiled for the purposes of targeted killing, which gives them a far greater degree of reliability than the very same lists when compiled on the basis of nomination by states, including the US, um, on strongly analogous criteria. And indeed, some of those who are arguing in favor uh, of uh, the expansion of targeted killing strategies argue that it should now be expanded to include those involved in provision of material support. So the very same individuals, therefore, who are on the um, uh, United Nations uh, um, uh, 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 list. And the list is published. I mean, you know, if that were to be a, a development, in other words, if it were to then be accepted that those providing material support are legitimate targets, then you know, you've got 230 names straight away on the website of the UN Security Council. Uh, and yet, we know the fallibility of the system uh, that that involves. So there are some very serious questions thrown up. I think amongst the most difficult and painful um, uh, and controversial questions is this. By adopting a law of war paradigm, a legal law of war paradigm, an international humanitarian law paradigm, we necessarily uh, have to recognize a new species of armed conflict. Before, in the old days, it was all very simple. War was essentially territorial. It took place inside countries or between countries. They were either international armed conflicts or they were what we used to call internal armed conflicts or civil wars. But the, battle, the boundaries of the battlefield nowadays are almost impossible to discern. Um, they're, 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 I mean, uh, Marco Sassoli, who's an international lawyer in Geneva, uh, speaks about his mother who lives in a little village in Italy and who lived through both the First and the Second World War. Uh, and from her point of view, she said she was perfectly happy, really, with the First World War because um, uh, all the men folk went off to war. They fought on a front line hundreds of miles away. And after the war, those who survived came back. But life in the village carried on much as normal in the meantime. Whereas during the Second World War, the war was brought home. There were bombs in the village. There were bombs in the town around them. People were dying near to them. And really what he's seeking to demonstrate is that you know, the nature of warfare changes. And it's one thing where you have a front line which is clearly identifiable. Uh, which is limited in time and space and is located many miles away. It's another thing when the boundaries of the battlefield begin to shatter and be brought home to um, all parts of the population. Well, now we're into the third generation where it's unclear where the conflict is taking place and where the claimed authority is an authority to uh, kill uh, anybody associated with Al-Qaeda wherever they are found in the world. Well, the uncomfortable consequence of that, like it or not, is that humanitarian law, the law of war, is reciprocal. By elevating al-Qaeda and its associates to the status of a party to a non-international armed conflict, we are asserting a right to kill them wherever we find them. 
but we are also bestowing on them a right to kill American forces wherever they find them within humanitarian law. Now, there are arguments to, to modif shave off the edge of this. I'm not saying that's an uncontroversial position. Some disagree. Some argue that it doesn't matter whether or not in, in humanitarian law they would be entitled to target American um, military assets because it would still be a crime under American domestic law. It's undoubtedly the case. But on an international law level, and this is an international law justification that we're discussing, uh, the uncomfortable reality, and it was being confirmed very recently by a statement from the International Committee of the Red Cross, its first really clear statement about targetability uh, last week, it is that uh, if the law of war applies, and that is essential to the current analysis, then the consequence is that American military personnel engaged in that strategy would be regarded in humanitarian law as legitimately targetable. Now that is a very troubling state of affairs to my mind because it elevates um, those involved in waging these dreadful, dreadful crimes um, uh, to a status that they uh, uh, um, certainly don't deserve and has a potential to weaken efforts to maintain international peace and security. So those are some of the problems that we're trying to grapple with. And uh, it'd be no surprise to say it, it, it's taking longer than perhaps we expected at the outset. Thank you, Mr. Amerson. That was a brilliant presentation. <laughs> made, 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 made without notes, I hasten to <laughs> observe. Um, so let, give. Can you give us a little bit of sense about what your investigation has actually done? Take us through the, mm -hmm. what, you know, where have you been, who have you talked to, mm -hmm. to the extent that you can say. Yeah. Um, they're, 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 as I sort of hinted at earlier on, there are two uh, separate um, tracks. One is to look at, uh, um, in discussion with state policymakers uh, at the basic legal framework questions the authorizations, and I don't mean domestic authorizations for the use of force, but the justifications in international law uh, for the use of force on the territory of other states, uh, to see where the areas of agreement and disagreement are, um, and to consider also the questions of sovereignty. Um, and so, as some of your audience may be aware, I did a visit uh, not very long ago in April to Pakistan, uh, which um, uh, involved meeting with senior Pakistani um, officials, including and up to foreign minister level, um, in order to put some of the difficult questions to the authorities of Pakistan that people quite understandably and rightly ask about Pakistan's uh, um, historically ambivalent relationship to the use of force on its own territory, uh, as well as meeting with some of the tribal maliks uh, and uh, at an admittedly entirely non-representative sample of individuals uh, who uh, gave their own personal accounts of involvement uh, uh, and, and, and having suffered injury in, in drone strikes. But that's a, um, th that the, the, pr the principal focus of a visit like that is on uh, engaging with the state as to its position and trying to get to the bottom of what in reality is taking place. Um, uh, at the same time, there are investigations taking place on the ground um, in particular parts of the world where individual strikes have been identified as having caused significant numbers of civilian casualties, not with a view, I hasten to add, um, of, of making any findings of civil or criminal responsibility or, or the correctness or otherwise, but rather of underlining uh, uh, and um, uh, of um, uh, establishing the need for an I independent accountability mechanism in relation to those deaths. In other words, some process by which uh, um, uh, the states deploying the technology and the states on whose territory it is deployed undertake and meet their obligation um, to ensure that where civilian lives have been lost, there is an effective independent official investigation which is capable of getting at the truth. So those, if you like, are the two parts. And there are inquiries taking place principally focused at Pakistan, Yemen, Afghanistan. Um, uh, uh, we've done a little work, but it's historical mainly in relation to Libya. Somalia is presenting, uh, it would be no surprise, very considerable difficulties uh, in terms of um, getting uh, accurate empirical data. 
uh, and um, a certain amount of work also in collaboration with others in relation to um, Palestine. Are you going to be traveling to Yemen? Yes. And uh, many other countries? In yes. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm speaking with reserve because okay. so, I mean, Yemen is a certainty, um, although the timing of it is, is still the subject of discussion. Um, uh, uh, Afghanistan, we have a UN presence which is doing detailed work on the ground already in documenting civilian casualties from all forms of conflict, including drones. So that data is effectively uh, in existence and independently verified by the offices of the UN already, the UNAMA um, uh, uh, operation in, Af in Afghanistan. Uh, it, some of the information, I mean, I, 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 I never ma made it clear at the very beginning of this process, I am not setting out to do a universal analysis of the number of civilian casualties or the ratio of civilian casualties to legitimate targets. We have currently very widely divergent estimates, um, although, um, as I think we discussed yesterday, there seems to be um, a, a sense in which even the top and lower end estimates are beginning to diverge with evidence of a diminishing number of civilian casualties, quite sharply diminishing number of casualties, in fact, um, in, in recent years, um, or in recent, cer certainly over the last 12 months. Um, uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a it, it visits, visits certainly. Uh, a lot of the diplomatic work can take place not without necessarily being in situ. Uh, some areas, as you know well, are extremely difficult to conduct investigations on the ground. And certainly, I don't need to conduct the physical investigations myself. I have other people who are working with me in order to do that. So it's interesting that you're not confining yourself to the CIA. Not at all. Yeah, program. Not at all. Which is, I mean, I, 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 I mean it's, a, it's a very important message to get across. This is about a form of technology and a strategy of targeted killing. Um, uh, it's been used in a variety of different contexts from Libya uh, to Afghanistan, uh, Somalia, Yemen, um, uh, uh, as well as Waziristan, uh, in very different situations, in fact, very different situations legally, very different situations factually on the ground. Um, so far, acknowledged three states using um, uh, drones for military purposes, but um, as I say, very, very shortly, I think we will see um, uh, others and indeed non-state actors using the technology. So it's, it's really about facing a challenge that is a global challenge. I mean, it's, it's, it's been, it has been a period in which the US has operated effectively with a monopoly over this technology, but that is over. Which countries do you think are closest? Uh, that's not the comment I would want at this stage to make. I, I mean, I, I understand. That's a, the, the, their, their discussions underway. I mean, certain amount of information is public. Um, France and Germany uh, have been dithering backwards and forwards. Germany has just uh, postponed a decision until after its next election. France has ostensibly postponed for longer. Um, uh, but they are all, as are Russia and China and many other states anxious to acquire the technology as quickly uh, as they possibly can. And it's their chief military strategic objective um, because they see it, its, it, its value not simply in terms of being able to deploy um, ordnance without putting personnel in immediate risk of fire, but also because it rapidly speeds up the decision-making process between um, identifying a target and uh, executing and an analyzing an operation, it dramatically alters the military advantage. And so in any uh, world where war remains or conflict remains a reality, uh, states that have the wherewithal and the resources to do so want to have the best available technology. This is the best available technology. Now, it was publicly reported after your trip to Pakistan, two, two I think, very interesting things. One is that every Pakistani official you spoke to, and you say up to the foreign minister, uh, said that Pakistan has not authorized uh, the use of drones. Yeah. Or, or did they say, um, we used to authorize, but we've changed our mind? I mean, we know Musharraf has said publicly that. No, it's, I mean, I, it, it's, yeah. it's all very carefully worded. Um, uh, it, 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 the, 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 the statement that came out after the end of the Pakistani visit uh, is, that, is, is that based on 
the information that was provided to me at consistently right across government at, at, at the highest level and throughout was that there is no continuing consent to the use of drones on Pakistani territory. Mm. Now, it's never, it's, it's, it's never been a secret that Musharraf authorized the use of drones during the Bush administration, and his revelation that he did was really no more than <laughs> confirming what's been an open secret for years. Um, it's no uh, secret that there have been um, WikiLeaks disclosures indicating that there have been nods and winks given by uh, members of the last, not immediately preceding, but the civilian administration that preceded that. Um, uh, uh, and, so, and, I th and I think it's probably right to say, I certainly wouldn't challenge anybody. Uh, based on what I, the information I've got, I would not challenge anybody who said to me that there remain continuing contacts between uh, uh, the Pakistani military and intelligence service uh, and the United States forces, uh, contacts which may facilitate and indeed provide information capable of being used to target individuals. If that was an assertion made, I would not seek to contradict it. So um, it's a very complex situation. But what seems to me to be the critical factor in this is that on the 12th of April of last year, both houses of parliament in Pakistan unanimously, without a single dissent, adopted a new resolution governing uh, consent to the use of Pakistani territory for the military force by other states, governing the relationship between Pakistan, uh, um, NATO, the US, um, and uh, ISAF. And the resolution says in terms that insofar as there may in the past have been any oral consents given, those consents are hereby rescinded. Mm. It says, henceforth oral consent is impermissible and of no effect. And it says that any consent to use Pakistani airspace or territory uh, can only be effected in writing. Uh, the agreement must be the subject of scrutiny by two parliamentary committees and once concluded must be the subject of a statement on the floor of the House. Now that is the position of the, the Pakistani parliament who are the democratically elected representatives of the people and it is a mandate binding the Pakistani government. Now, as a matter of international law therefore if we ask ourselves the question what is the position of Pakistan who occupies the seat of Pakistan at the United Nations, the position is very clear. Uh, and were that to be any other state in the world where the elected representatives of the people in cabinet government, but with the unanimous support of both houses of parliament, had taken a particular position on consent to the use of territory, but the military or intelligence were acting inconsistently with that, First of all, no one would question what the legal position was, and secondly, they'd march the relevant military officers off to jail. Right? Why is Pakistan different? Well, Pakistan is different. Pakistan's different not as a matter of law. As a matter of law, that is the position, in my view. But it's different because it's such a fragile democracy. This, is, this election that happened this weekend is the very first time in the history of Pakistan that a full civilian government has served a full term without military intervention and has handed over through the democratic process to another democratically elected administration. Now we all, I think, recognize that democracy is the enemy of terrorism. Democracy uh, and the promotion of respect for the rule of law is in the end the battle of ideas with which we are all engaged. Uh, and it is also the means by which to bring to those areas of the world that, that are, uh, have the conditions really conducive to the spread of terrorism, uh, the oxygen of economic development, of democratic and political participation, that is the antithesis of the recruitment to violent extremism. Therefore, all who are concerned with peace and stability in the region need to do everything that they can to promote respect for Pakistani democracy. Well, two hours after that resolution was passed on the 12th of April last year, there was a drone strike in Waziristan. And one has to ask oneself, first of all, what message does that send to the people of Pakistan about the value of democracy? Uh, and secondly, 
how, how can it be in those circumstances legitimate for Pakistan to take that position and repeatedly uh, in the United Nations to object to the use of its territory to accuse the United States of violating its sovereignty and territorial integrity and if what I'm told is true sending note verbals of complaint citing the resolution as the basis for it um, for uh, us to claim to be promoting democracy whilst at the same time so flagrantly undermining it. And so to my mind, there is a very real premium uh, on supporting the Pakistani democratic process and enabling democracy to take root. So n not only from a legal point of view, from a legal point of view, it seems to me the position is unequivocal. Pakistan, the nation, the representatives of Pakistan, those the world, the international community recognizes as representing Pakistan, do not consent. Uh, and from a political point of view, if we believe in the promotion of democracy as the route to ending violent extremism, and I for one most certainly do, uh, then, um, then we need to ensure that both aid, as economic aid, is focused uh, on um, rewarding uh, the um, promotion of democracy and that military intervention is um, attenuated so as to ensure that democracy is not fundamentally under, uh, 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 undermined. Any discussion with Pakistani officials about why they don't use their F-16s to shoot Yes, down? of course. Uh, um, uh, uh, on why they don't use their F-16s, on why they haven't raised the issue with the Security Council, on why they haven't done more. Of course, I pressed them on that. Um, uh, and the short answer is not a really very surprising one, in fact. Um, the United States, the pa Pakistan does not want to be in a war with the United States. At the moment, the war is going on between the United States and non-armed groups within the federally administered tribal areas of Pakistan. Um, uh, Pakistan does not want to find itself engaged in armed conflict with the US by attacking United States military assets directly. More particularly, I mean, more generally than that, I don't think, I mean, that's, that's a very narrow way of putting it. More generally, the way it was put to me was this, that, that Pakistan has a very broad relationship with the United States across a very wide range of issues, which is critical to Pakistan's um, infrastructure and indeed to the maintenance of its development, its growth and its democracy. Uh, and that though this is one area on which there is profound disagreement, um, it, it's not an issue about which it is worth severing relationships with the United States. I mean, it's a, it's a cost-benefit analysis from the point of view of those who are responsible for making these decisions in Pakistan. We know that, that, that there was a very significant deterioration in di diplomatic relationships after one particular um, uh, 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 a tragic mistake in which a large number, or significant number of Pakistani military um, uh, uh, personnel were uh, in error. Um, targeted and, and killed. Um, but by and large, you know, Pakistan has to consider a wide range of issues in its m international relations, of which this is one. Uh, and so I, it, it doesn't cause me the slightest surprise that a weak state is not in a position to engage in a military engagement with the United States. Um, a more delicate question is why doesn't the um, Pakistan complain directly to the Security Council of a violation of its um, uh, of its territorial integrity? Well, I mean, that's a very interesting question because it raises a much broader issue. Where is the Security Council in all of this? Hmm. Uh, it, since 2001, the Security Council has formally recognized that Al-Qaeda represents a threat to international peace and security. Uh, and, and as a result, that means that the Council has all of the Chapter 7 charter powers available to it from the imposition of sanctions that's the basis for the al-qaeda sanctions list right the way up to the use of military force if necessary um, but of course i mean the united states has not sought security council approval for the use of force inside Waziristan, mm -hmm. which it would have been open to it to do now that may be, and, and people would say in response, well, that's just not the real world. You'd never get China and, and, and Russia to consent to you using drones inside Pakistan. But in a sense, I don't think it means the question isn't worth asking because you know, the council is there partly to s s help maintain peace and security. Because it's difficult to get a decision through the council to authorize the use of military force, I mean, 
And that may be an obstacle to the deployment of military force, but that's exactly what it's meant to be. It's meant to make the deployment of military force more difficult. But another way of asking the question is this. I mean, the principal justification that the United States uses um, for deploying force in Pakistan uh, is self-defense uh, uh, under Article 51 of the UN Charter. Um, but Article 51 imposes an obligation as, on states that invoke it to report the use of force to the Security Council. Ordinarily, obviously, Article 51 was envisaged as a situation where a state uses force to defend itself against aggression from another state. And there's been a long-running debate about whether or not a state can use force under Article 51 as part of its defense, self-defense, against a non-state actor. I think I'm right in saying that the majority view, although it's not unanimous, is that it does entitle states to use um, uh, force in self-defense against a non-state actor, but it also carries with it an obligation to report the use of force to the Security Council. There's no suggestion that that is a practice that's been um, followed or ad adopted or followed in relation to uh, the deployment of drones. At the end of the day, I mean, Pakistan's answer to the question that you're asking is, you know, we are a, 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 in a very, very awkward and difficult position. Mm. We have 145,000 of our own troops stationed in and around the Fatah region. We do not accept or regard this as an armed conflict inside Pakistan. We regard it as a law enforcement operation. We have a long-term strategy which involves dialogue and engagement with some of these groups. The situation is immensely complicated as it now is with the, the core leadership of Al-Qaeda really destroyed. There being a, a number uh, of remaining what they call foreigners, foreign fighters, people from outside the region basically, um, uh, well, from various different parts of the world, but people who would be identified as Al-Qaeda. Um, but then there are also Afghan, Pakistan, uh, Afghan Taliban, Pakistani Taliban, and a very large number of um, different tribal, um, Pashtun tribal groups, all of whom look the same, all of whom carry guns, as you know, wherever they go, and who form and break allegiances with one another with alarming frequency, so that half the time the Pakistani army is trying to fight an insurgency against one group and then finds that that group has joined with a group with whom it's acting in alliance. So it's an extraordinarily complex mosaic of, 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 of constantly moving and shifting allegiances. And the attitude of Pakistan is we need the time, space and support to tackle this problem intelligently. And what you're doing by continuing now to send military ordnance through the air is, is, is you may be eliminating individuals who are legitimate targets but at the same time you're making the war the long-term struggle for peace um, uh, one which is going to go on that much longer win the battle lose the war is the attitude that the Pakistani authorities have I'm conscious in some of the things I'm saying that you may be perceiving a view on my part and 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 I don't think that, that would be a fair assumption if you if you are I, I'm I'm listening to as many people as I can to try to assist the dialogue. Um, I mean, I, I've, I have made that statement about Pakistani consent because the position on that one issue seems to me to be legally very, very clear. But on uh, 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 all other issues, my principal role in this is facilitating a dialogue. It doesn't really matter what I think. At the end of the day, I suspect I shall forbear from expressing a clear opinion on any of the legal framework debates because there are many you can you know, I tell you you can put your finger in the air uh, and you will you know pick up a passing academic who has an opinion on the subject and there are as many academics as there are opinions and as many opinions as there are academics and I, and, and, and others as well I don't just I wasn't meaning to denigrate academics I mean pra practicing lawyers within government and so on um, uh, and I don't think adding, uh, two things, I don't think those who shout loudest are necessarily right, and I don't think adding my voice to the myriad of voices that there are with different views on the subject is necessarily right. And I don't think what academics and practicing lawyers think really matters, because what matters is what states do, how they behave, and what agreements they make. And part of what I'm trying to do is to foster a dialogue between the United States and Europe in particular, but also those states on whose territory uh, the um, technology has been deployed. The, um I mean, in a way, what we're talking about is the collapse of sort of a Westphalian kind of concept of, 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 of warfare. Mm. 
And I mean, there's a very interesting observation that Rosa Brooks, who's a fellow here, has made. You know, the responsibility to protect, which is basically a liberal humanitarian idea, is based on the idea that states that can't control their own territory or not, a, you know, where there's genocide going on, other states can intervene, essentially abnegating their national sovereignty. The flip side of that idea is essentially the drone program, right? Because the, what the United States would say is these states don't control their own territory. Um, we are you know, facing potential violence from the actors uh, who are not being controlled, and therefore we have the right to intervene. So in both cases, I mean, uh, it's a, well, uncomfortable perhaps for liberals to kind of recognize. There's a link between the two. There's a link between the two. So, and just a sort of, and before we mm. move to that, you know, it is obviously the reason that people are having this discussion at all. It is confusing about whether this is a law enforcement exercise or a war. That's a, the fact that people are confused about it is legitimate. Is mm. there, and you know, the nearest sort of analog and we've, of which we've had long experience is piracy, which is a, a crime that ha is, has elements of warfare. Mm. I mean, presumably, in international law, there's quite a lot that has been read and uh, said about piracy. I mean, there's many statutes that exist. So would there be a kind of Geneva, you know, new convention on drones that would sort of try and address these problems that wouldn't say this comfortably fits in the law of war box or the law enforcement box, but is something new and we're just going to, here's how we're going to think about it. Um, the question of whether we need a new uh, or an updated international treaty effectively uh, to revisit the Geneva Conventions is, I think, probably the most difficult question. Um, uh, it causes absolute shivers. Um, uh, and rightly, it causes absolute shivers across the world because people think that the moment that you unpick the structure that exists, then there will be a free-for-all um, where the result is far from being um, a structure that restricts and limits conflict, one which is more permissive uh, and enables Form, certain forms of conflict to be more easily waged. And there's a legitimate point of view that says that when you trace through the analysis that we are entitled to move on to the territory of a state that is unwilling or unable to deal effectively with terrorists who pose a threat to us, there is a responsible body of opinion that says that that translates into saying strong states are entitled to invade the territory of fragile states uh, and that, that enshrining that in a new um, uh, agreement uh, would be to enshrine the, a, a recipe for um, uh, a, a breakdown in, in, in um, peace and security. In other words, that in fact, it, it's a very, very dangerous thing to open up the, uh, the conventions uh, and that a more productive uh, strategy and certainly one which would be more likely to um, produce some sort of result in the shorter term is to negotiate agreements of understanding. In other words, to try to come to a common understanding. I mean, I think I think what what needs to be said very loud and clear, and what's not well understood, I think, outside the United States certainly is that this administration is committed to trying to find a way of doing this within international law. However much people may disagree with the strategy on, on p for political reasons, they are trying to find a way of accommodating it within an international law framework. By that I mean they are, uh, I mean, I, I, Harold Coe uses the word translation to describe the process. In other words, he says, um, uh, here are these principles. They were culled in an, a, a former age where war was territorial, and therefore it made sense to talk in territorial terms. We're now dealing with a new form of, of conflict, a non-international but transnational armed conflict with a non-state uh, group. And that is not what was contemplated by the conventions. Now, when a, a, an old statute comes up for interpretation by a court in a new situation, whether it be you know, a statute about the preservation of human tissue and then suddenly there's a new form of stem cell research, uh, the question arises, what is the limit of a court's interpretive discretion? Always. 
I mean, you have statutes passed in the 1800s which come up for consideration in, in, in modern day circumstances. And a court has to try to fit the statute as best it can around a changed technological or, or social or economic situation. And it's very familiar to lawyers, this, this debate, because sometimes there comes a point where a court says, I can't go any further. The job of a court is to interpret. But if you're really asking me not to interpret, but to legislate, that's not my job. That's the job for the legislature. That's a classic dilemma in, it for in every courtroom where constitutional law questions arise. What are the limits of judicial authority to interpret? Uh, and there's an analogy to be drawn there. Is this something that can be, uh, can be negotiated by means of an interpretation of the existing framework? Certainly, this administration thinks it, ha it, it is doing that. It's not saying to hell with the Geneva Conventions, to hell with international law. It's saying within international law, this is how we analyze it. Um, this is our translation of this law into current, every um, mm -hmm. modern day um, uh, situations. Now, m many would say translation is a very generous word for what is involved. Some would say it's not translation, it's, it's, it's gone beyond that. It's a new type of, of, of analysis. But that is precisely the debate with which we're all engaged. I mean, I just, uh, I, I, I just it might be worth just, I, I, brought with me um, the text of a, of, a, oh, excuse me, of a lecture that Harold Coe gave um, just last week at, 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 at Oxford University. And I just, just wanted to read out a couple of passages which, I mean, I, with which I agree um, and which kind of encapsulate the problem. He says, first of all, the, the present administration has not done enough to be transparent about legal standards and the decision-making process that it's been applying. Uh, it hasn't been sufficiently transparent to the media, to Congress, uh, or to our allies. Because the administration has been so opaque, a left-right coalition from Code Pink to Paul Rand has now spoken out against the drone program, fostering a growing perception that the program is not lawful, not necessary, but illegal, unnecessary, and out of control. The administration must take responsibility for this failure because it's persistent and counter productive lack of transparency has led to the release of necessary pieces of its public legal defense too little and too late. As a result, the public has increasingly lost track of the real issue, which is not drone technology per se, but the need for transparent, agreed upon, domestic and international legal process and standards. Now, he goes on to say, the administration, as well as being more transparent and more consultative, must be, quotes, more willing to discuss international legal standards for the use of drones so that our actions do not inadvertently empower other nations, and he cites China, North Korea, or Iran, or other non-state actors who would use drones inconsistent with the law. I mean, I do think the case now for uh, greater transparency and accountability and for um, uh, international agreement on the standards is pressing and overwhelming, and to be honest, could it wait for another treaty? I don't think so. I think by the time we have another treaty, we'll be looking at a whole new generation of weapons. You know, uh, it seems that when American officials uh, go to Oxford University, they actually say different things than they would if they would to here. So, so to give you an example, the Pentagon Council uh, you know, gave, I think, a speech to the Oxford Union, and he said, you know, we should be thinking about the time when the war on terror is sort of over. Mm. And as, as we, when we discussed yesterday, I think, the movement in Congress now, uh, when the discussion of the authorization for the use of military force, which could theoretically be over when combat troops are taken out of Afghanistan at the end of uh, 2014, the movement in Congress seems to be actually, instead of either ending this authorization or, or making it much more constrained, to actually enlarge it. It seems that that's kind of the mood right now. So in a sense, uh, you know, if that were to happen, uh, you'd actually have a much more expansive uh, uh, program, which would be uh, you know, at least it, within American law, better kind of articulated where, uh, because at the, at the end of the day, the AUM, AUMF was about the people who attacked us on 9-11. Mm -hmm. So if you're going after the Islamic Jihad Union, which is an Uzbek group, it's hard to sort of really connect them to the events of 9-11. So in your talks and in your thinking about this, uh, what, what's your... That's a very interesting question. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, I don't presume to say anything and won't say anything uh, um, uh, uh, about the um, 
uh, authorization for the use of military force discussions here, partly because I'm not qualified to, partly because it's outside my mandate. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, my concern is about international law and, inter and, uh, and human rights issues. Um, and I don't think that it's helpful for me to, um, uh, uh, or indeed that I'm qualified to, to engage in a debate about the detail of the way in which the um, uh, AUMF is, is or should be recast. Um, w what I would say is this, that, that um, there is a growing movement, and it may not be coalescing yet, um, but there is, a, there is a strand of opinion within this administration and its closest friends uh, that if we, if, if, if we are to move forward, we need to think about this as not being a never-ending war. Now, if you accept the basic war paradigm, and, and as I say, that in itself is hugely controversial, but if one, if one works through the, base, through, through the issue from the basic war paradigm, that, that there then has to be some concept of the way in which this war can come to an end. Because we know, and I, mean, I, I, I don't think there's anybody in the global security community who, 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 who would predict that no matter what strategy we adopt or is adopted uh, or could ever be adopted, uh, we will see an end to jihadist terrorism during the next three generations. I mean, whatever might happen beyond that, no one can predict. But there is no question of jihadist terrorism linked in one way or another to Al-Qaeda's basic core philosophy coming to an end in my lifetime, my children's lifetime, or their children's lifetime. So, um, therefore, we have struggled for a decade after the, the shock the tectonic shift that 9-11 represented with exceptionalism, with you know, suspending our commitment to basic core values. And that hasn't worked. Not only has it not worked, but we've ended up with now probably 30, up, 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 upwards of 30 different organizations around the world all engaged in active conflict in the name of the same jihadist agenda. I mean, one of the one of the ghastly realities when we look back in history at the evil geniuses who conceived of, 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 of strategic, world-changing um, military strategies. You know, we, we think of Hitler and those who look at, 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 at global strategy will say, well, you know, the man may have been mad, but he was a genius as well. I mean, the same is true of bin Laden. You know, the man invented the notion of a global jihad some would say, by the way in which the West reacted, we accelerated that process. But one thing is for sure, we have a global jihad on our hands now. Um, you know, it, it definitely did work. He succeeded. I mean, there's an Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. There's an Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. You know, we've been fighting Al-Qaeda in Mali. They can ban up, they're now back up in, in, um, in, uh, in, in Libya. They're crossing through Niger. They're down in Uganda. They're over in Syria, they're in Chechnya, there are Chechen fighters in Syria, there are, you know, I mean, no, seriously, there's a huge Chechen brigade fighting in Syria alongside a massive Al-Qaeda operation. And who within Syria is set up an infrastructure? Who set up courts and hospitals? The Al-Qaeda brigades. So, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I think that, um, I, think, I think, you know, th th there's some real food for thought in some of that. Just before we throw it open, one final question. It, it was reported after your trip to uh, Pakistan that the Pakistani government told you that 400 civilians have been killed. That fits pretty neatly with um, the low end of the estimates of the Bureau of Investigative Journalism and our estimates here, once you add in some people that we can't mm -hmm. exactly categorize as civilians who may be unknowns rather than militants. So that seems like a very plausible number. Uh, did they elaborate? No, and, and, and I asked for disaggregation um, twice, uh, and it didn't appear, um, although I can tell you a little bit about methodology so far as there is a methodology. Um, uh, but, I, I mean, the request for disaggregation continued. Mm. Um, the bottom line is that, that 
there is a genuine security obstacle to the investigation of the deaths that follow from drone strikes. That's mm -hmm. undoubtedly the case within Fatah. Um, it, it, not only are the strikes tending to happen in very remote areas, uh, but the security situation on the ground is unstable. The Fatah Secretariat has no effective police force. It's not how Fatah has been governed ever since the British left. The British left a legacy of, a, of an area which w was accepted to be ungovernable um, and that the Pashtun people should be entitled to regulate their own affairs uh, and to uh, guide themselves not by civilian law but by Pashtun Valley, by the local, um, by, by the local tribal law, and they do. And they have, or at least they have for a very long time. Um, they say now that their entire tribal structure for decision making is broken down because you know, I mean, one of the, cl the classic ways in which decisions are made is the convening of a tribal yoga, uh, and which is a group in, a situation in which men sit together in a circle and they all carry guns and they all have great big turbans. And I mean, <laughs> when, when I met them in Islamabad, they were laughing and joking with me and saying, look, if you saw my photograph in the newspaper, what would you think I looked like? And, and, and one of the tragedies is that one of the most notorious strikes in which a large number of civilians died, sadly, was a yoga which had been called in order to get two tribes to unite in order to expel uh, Al-Qaeda militants from the area in which they were. And that, I'm afraid, has resonated throughout the tribal community and has caused a sort of major uh, breakdown. But um, uh, the Secretariat, ba basically, their working method goes as follows. Um, when there's a strike, uh, if it's successfully hit militants, no one comes to tell us. Hmm. I if civilians have died, someone comes to uh, the secretariat and says, our family members have been died, have been killed. They then conduct an inquiry to find out if this person was or was not a civilian. Uh, and it's on the basis of that information that they compile their statistics. Now, I mean, I, I have to say, I have, some, I have some difficulty with the idea that there is a completely clear-cut distinction here between civilians and, 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 and militants. I mean, you know, these are tribal peoples. Uh, they, they operate in a way that involves, you know, the use of violence against one another even. You know, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult to draw some of these distinctions. It's obviously, it's completely different when you're dealing with foreign fighters who've come into the area because they are easily distinguishable because they're not you know, Pashtun um, or they're not local Pashtun. Um, but I think that some of the other distinctions are extremely, extremely difficult to draw and must in the end depend on a combination of human intelligence and signals intelligence. And it's the human intelligence element that worries me most um, because uh, I mean, the point is an obvious one. If you are a paid informant to provide information to the ISI uh, as to who within your village is associating with uh, um, uh, a militant organization, you are faced with a choice. You know, you either identify the real people and run the risk of being beheaded, mm. or you identify somebody whose house down the road you would like to occupy, um, or whatever, or somebody with whom you've got a long-running tribal um, dispute and, and, and as with a lot of these, as with a lot of these um, uh, uh, tribal um, uh, uh, legal structures, the Pashtun Valley has revenge as its heart. Mm. You know, and I mean, one of the well, I see somebody shaking. Yeah, his head. Question, yeah. yeah, but it is a part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so so the, the short answer is I don't I don't know how reliable the statistics are. Um, and I think Pakistan has a responsibility to do a great deal more, to be honest, to get to the bottom of some of these mm. uh, uh, um, in in incidents. And if it involves working more closely with the Maliks in the area to get the details, then more needs to be done. But let's face it, there are two ends of the story. You know, it's not just Pakistan that needs to be more forthcoming or do more to get to the realities. It's also those who are dispatching this technology because they have a record which is in, uh, capable of, of determining 
whether or not there is a serious risk of civilian casualties from a visual recording. And there will, in each case, have been an analysis of the success or failure of an operation and the extent of civilian casualties. And remaining silent over that, without giving any realistic sense of what the truth is, simply leaves the space open for claims that are inaccurate and exaggerated to be made, which in itself is a threat to security. Great. Well, we'll take questions. Uh, if, you can, if you have a question, can you wait for the mic? And we'll start with Akab Malik, who is a visiting here uh, from National Defense University of Pakistan and is a Pashtun and is at SAIS. Right, you've done the introduction. <laughs> I stand out, do I? Um, I had a lot of questions. I wrote a lot down, but you answered most of them anyway. Um, situation. I, I, you know, we can talk a lot about Pashtun Wali and Pashtun Wali and what Badal is, what, what mm. you call revenge. It's reciprocity. Sorry, and I, can't, I never said that word properly Reciprocity, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the point of the matter is that, that c that's a give and take, and that's instilled in that society primarily to maintain a certain amount of law and order and deterrence, so that if you take mine, I have to take yours. It's built in and allows a certain amount of peace. Taliban, in fact, have been, separately to this, been detribalizing um, those, those areas primarily because uh, detribalization is a process of Islamization. Uh, tribal society doesn't exist well with uh, Islam primarily because for most Pashtun, being Pashtun is more important. Mm. And that doesn't bode well for the Taliban at the end of the day. So they've been killing off a lot of Maliks, especially in, I mean, this is uh, the true for Afghanistan and southern areas as well as it is true for Fatah. Um, What's the question? But the question. No, it's very helpful though. Well, when I, this, yeah. I had to add that. But when we're talking about undermining legal frameworks, undermining uh, international law, which is what a lot of countries, in fact, see the United States as doing when they strike into uh, another country and infringe its territorial integrity, given especially now that Pakistan has unanimously said that it doesn't agree with it and does not want this, and et cetera, et cetera. One of the biggest concerns also is India, which you didn't touch upon, for, for Pakistan, that is that this may give a certain amount of legitimacy, US actions through precedent maybe, mm. to strike into Pakistan. However, the problem here is that Pakistan has a different relationship with India, uh, unlike with the United States. It has seen India as an enemy mm. since 1947, uh, uh, has fought, four, we could say, three and a half wars. Um, the like response would be very difficult and very different. Yeah. And escalation is very likely. We have a lot of questions. So, and I so, so oh, you, you go went ahead. On time. <laughs> so, so my point is, couldn't that be played up primarily to, to consolidate or cement real rules on the use of drones in other territories? Yeah. I mean, I just say it's not my job to play anything up. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I understand exactly what you're saying. One thing is that certain is that that as greater transparency emerges from the U.S. as to the legal rationale for the strategy, um, U.S. officials will say and are entitled to say that if other states remain silent in the face of that, that is the beginnings of a principle of acquiescence. Mm. And um, I think that is, I mean, a, a certainty, but I think at the same time, what carries with what, 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 what's carried with it is the need to, 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 as I said earlier on, I think very much a recognition of the fact that um, the U.S. N now needs to engage with a framework that it would be content to see other states using. Uh, Mr. McGovern, who's a long-time CIA officer, now retired. Hi. Hi, Ben. <laughs> I uh, the picture you draw of global jihad is rather chilling. Um, I'm bothered by the notion that we here in this country are subjected to uh, the idea that these people self-radicalize. Uh, they look in the mirror in the morning and say, hey, it looks like a good day to self-radicalize. There are legitimate grievances and they need to be acknowledged. My question is very simple and it pertains to that. Uh, you mentioned that before a, a drone strike, there's a really difficulty trying to make a clear-cut distinction between civilians and militants. How do you suppose it looks 
after a drone strike? Good question. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, I think that's where the accountability question comes in. I, 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 I make it clear that when I say there's a great, that there's an apparent difficulty of distinction, I say that from a, currently, as for most of us, a position of ignorance as to how that distinction is being drawn. And one of the things that I am anxious to try to do in this process is to encourage such transparency as can be given without compromising legitimate security interests as to the process by which those choices are being made. Um, because I suspect there may be more, um, s there may, you know, more that can sensibly be said about the accuracy and reliability of some of those choices. But in the absence of information about it, looking at it from the outside, I see a high risk of misidentification, which is, of course, reinforced by the fact that a number of individuals seem to have been killed on multiple occasions, which is a, <laughs> a remarkable uh, and unfortunate feat. Um, uh, 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 but I mean, I think the process, uh, you know, I mean, this, I, I'm not sure whether you're tilting at the idea of, um, uh, of uh, 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 the, the, the criteria by which a decision is made after the event to determine whether or not an individual was or was not engaged with, 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 with militant uh, activity. We, you know, I mean, one option here is to get to what Mr. McGovern was saying, perhaps, is to have some sort of after action review mm. that would, and what would be the mechanism for that, and who would do that, that it would be seen as sort of legitimate by the UN or other international. Well, there, I mean, there is, of course, an after action review. Yeah, but we don't know anything about it. That's the point. Um, we don't know enough about it. We can't yeah. know everything yeah. about it, but we don't know enough about it. Um, uh, inevitably, there's an after action review because, as a minimum, a decision has to be, an assessment has to be made as to whether or not the military objective of the attack was achieved. Um, but equally, you know, it's not the aim of the US military to kill civilians. That is not mm. its objective. Um, its objective is to minimize the risk of the loss of civilian life. So it needs to make an assessment as to whether or not um, a mistake has been made or an error has been made. But more can undoubtedly be said about the means by which that assessment is made. And I think, to be fair, more should be said about what the findings are, not of an e in each individual case. But I mean, I, I have had discussions with the United Kingdom, and I'm not holding this up, uh, them up uh, uh, as, a, as a paradigm, because I don't think their transparency and accountability systems are as well developed as they might, might be. Um, uh, but they are prepared to say and have said in response to parliamentary questions how many people they consider they have killed erroneously in drone strikes in Afghanistan and what happened in relation to the investigation that followed. And the way that it works, I mean, very crudely, and it, uh, well, perhaps I shouldn't go into too much detail, but I think, I think, I think that within the UK system, um, there's, a, there's a basic, process by which the distinction choice is made, first of all, um, uh, and then following the strike, an analysis takes place of what had occurred, and if there is thought to have been any possibility of a risk of a civilian casualty, there will then be a, a, an investigation, usually, um, by the military police. Now, I think that there may, I mean, there may then be a room for a hybrid process of independent inquiry of each strike rather than um, leaving those who have been involved with the responsibility of having to review it. But I mean, that's a, that's a, a detailed question to be looked at um, uh, as we move forward. But, but I tell you one thing, um, Israel, and I'm not commenting for a second on whether this process is um, carried into effect effectively, um, but since the 2006 decision of the Israeli Supreme Court on targeted killing and two subsequent commissions which have set out the procedural and systematic, systemic requirements for um, independent and high-level review of targeting decisions and of subsequent accountability reviews has quite a detailed calibrated mechanism for legal and independent review both before and critically after the event. And um, they are now transparent about what that system is. Uh, and I think that Israel feels that it's got quite a lot to say um, about how transparency can operate. And I actually think quite a, you know, people in this country and abroad w would, would certainly feel more comfortable if they knew what the system was, 
if they felt comfortable with the system in terms of there being a sufficient degree of oversight and independent review within a, a security and classified framework, and if people were told, listen, we, we screwed up last week, you know, it's a terrible tragedy, but accidentally we had a, had a, had a, had a, had a terrible mishit. Um, and that happens occasionally, and it happens in Afghanistan. And the families are paid compensation because it's a regular DOD engagement. And, 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 and when it, when it, where it's happened with the UK military, you know, there's been acknowledgement and there's been compensation paid. That makes a significant difference. And it closes down some of the territory, the intellectual territory, that's left open for, um, uh, for misrepresentation. So, I, I mean, I actually I don't believe this is a battle between freedom of information advocates and government secrecy advocates. I think that both sides really ought to be engaged in a search for truth and success and peace and security. And if they are, greater transparency will serve the interests of both. We, we have a lot more questions that are running a little bit over. Do you have time? I'm to fine. Okay, so we're going to start bunching them together. Sean Waterman of the Washington Times, this gentleman here next to him. Yes, uh, thanks very much, Ben. That was a very thanks, sure. interesting presentation. Um, on the transparency question, do you think that that will be helped at all if the program was transferred to the U.S. military? As uh, I missed the beginning of your talk, so mm. forgive me if I if you addressed that already. But would you comment on on that? And also, is there a sense in which you know um, the United States, uh, which I think probably does have. Uh, more transparency in regard to its intelligence services than most democracies have. I mean, you know, when the British had a targeted killing policy in Northern Ireland, they kept it secret until the Manchester mm. cops stumbled over mm. it, right? So, so um, is there a sense in which the United States is, is, is suffering because it's actually more transparent about these things than, say, the Russians, the Chinese, or even the French? Um, and this gentleman here. you just identify yourself? Yeah. My name is Alfredo Miranda. I'm a correspondent with Hispan TV. And I have a straight question for you. As of today, the use of drones is a violation of human rights? Thank you. Okay. Together? Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not in a position to answer that question unequivocally at this point in time. Um, uh, it's it certainly from the point of view of the individuals and the victims, and there have been significant numbers of civilian casualties, their right to life, as far as they're concerned, has been violated. Um, uh, there's been a very recent and significant decision in the Peshawar High Court, which follows from, um, uh, uh, follows from those civilian casualties and directs Pakistan now to um, take action, not military action, but action short of military action, but up to and including the severance of diplomatic ties if the, United, if, 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 um, if the drone attacks continue. Mm -hmm. But you can't make, give an unequivocal answer to a question that says, are drone attacks a, a, a human rights violation? It's like saying, is it a human rights violation to shoot someone? It all depends on the circumstances. Sometimes it's a human rights violation not to shoot someone, because if you don't, they're going to kill somebody else. So I'm afraid, um, uh, you know, first of all, drones are not a weapon, they're a delivery system. Uh, and secondly, um, I'm afraid it's, it, 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 if, if the question were capable of such a simple answer, I wouldn't be engaged in this extremely long and detailed <laughs> and difficult inquiry. Um, uh, can I come back to the other question? I, I, I'm, uh, I'm, first of all, um, I'm very interested uh, 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 to learn more about the um, <clears throat> extent of the Senate's in Intelligence Select Committee's review uh, of drone strikes and their legitimacy. Um, and that's one of the issues that I want to um, uh, inquire into. And you're absolutely right to say uh, that, that uh, parliamentary oversight, Senate uh, oversight of, of uh, the CIA is significantly more um, uh, calibrated and um, uh, robust than is to be found in terms of the oversight of uh, other 
intelligence services in many other democratic countries. On the other hand, um, uh, they don't tell us much about it. I mean, we're still waiting for the release of the uh, report that I um, <coughs> uh, on uh, the secret detention uh, interrogation uh, and brackets torture program un close brackets Pardon? well I mean I think you know even Joe Biden has um, added his voice to a call for its publication now uh, 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 it was the subject of a recommendation I made to the United States in my report to the Human Rights Council in March and also incidentally to the United Kingdom who've got an interim report that they're sitting on on um, uh, the involvement of United Kingdom officials in um, uh, 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 interrogations that have involved the use of torture um, in, uh, in counter-terrorism operations. So you know, we've got these two reports, they're both sitting there under wraps. I mean, I, I, I'm a firm believer in the idea that accountability um, and reckoning with the past is a crucial way of, of moving forward. And, and you know, uh, when we talk about, you mentioned earlier on, you know, how do we disengage from this conflict? Does it have, is it capable of having an end or are we looking at a, at a forever war. I mean, you know, I go back to what Harold Coe said at Oxford last week. You know, he's saying that the critical steps are disengagement from Afghanistan, closure of Guantanamo Bay and a reckoning with the past, uh, and a, 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 an approach which does not aggregate together every group with an Islamist agenda, but focuses very tightly on Al-Qaeda and on um, uh, the core Al-Qaeda um, uh, uh, machine. Now, you know, there may be some very interesting debates to be had around that last question, um, but that there should be some means of disengagement from this conflict, I think, is something with which the American public generally would agree. Um, will, uh, w w will moving um, the, the drone policy over to the DOD um, increase transparency or accountability? I mean, you know, obviously, everybody's familiar with the basic dilemma that, 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 that uh, the agency has oversight in, in, through the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, that doesn't exist directly within DOD. But on the other hand, DOD has published rules of engagement. Uh, and um, in the past, where things have gone wrong, DOD has been uh, more transparent about dealing with them. I mean, I think there is a very real question as to who ever thought it was a good idea to wage an international campaign of air-based warfare um, through an agency which, because of its nature, has to stick to the NCND, neither confirm nor deny the existence of the program. Um, because it was always going to result in um, a, a deficit of transparency, uh, um, which, which, um, which leaves open far too much uh, intellectual and debate space. Um, for for uh, for misrepresentation. I mean, I, it, it 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 can't have been really thought through from the outset that the agency was the right branch of government to be deploying this amount of ordnance through the air because it isn't a secret, you know, and uh, agencies deal in secrets. Um, uh, but. I mean, I'd like to say that transferring to DOD would regularise the position, but I don't know that I'm in, I mean, from the outside, that sounds sensible. Um, but the devil always is in the detail. And if the transfer is made with a carve out for Pakistan, which is one of the suggestions, as I understand, it's on the table. In other words, that, that the agency would retain operations in Pakistan, but everything else would be transferred to DOD. Uh, that doesn't sound as though it would be likely to make a huge difference to the situation on the ground. But I have to say, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to shoot from the hip about what I think the right answer to these questions is. I'm involved in conversations which I hope will enable me to have a better grasp of what I can and can't legitimately say about what ought to happen next. Um, uh, but I, I don't believe that there is, there are many who, uh, within this administration, who disagree with the proposition that greater transparency would be a good thing, um, both in terms of gaining public support at home and abroad, and in a greater understanding of the, of the program as a whole. In the front here, Medea Benjamin, Copink. Oh, uh, wait, wait for the microphone, just for a sec. Uh, 
Well, lots of questions. Um, uh, the uh, high court decision in Peshawar, how significant is that and what does that mean for what Nawaz, Nawaz Sharif might or might not do? And then on this issue of um, personality versus signature strikes, do you, the, the signature strikes, is that something that you find uh, particularly problematic and uh, the use of secondary stripes, uh, strikes, double taps that have uh, killed uh, humanitarian workers. And lastly, uh, supposedly the U.S. uses the drone strikes in places where it can't capture people, but we have uh, a number of incidents where we know that people have been in uh, very easy places to capture. And so uh, could you comment on that? Um, the Peshawar High Court decision, uh, I would characterize as more of a, of, a, of, a, of a judicial outpouring of angst and anger uh, <laughs> than, um, I don't mean an individual, I mean I, I, I think it reflects a very real and passionate um, degree of, 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 of um, opposition within Pakistan, um, both to the, to, the, to the use of drones uh, and also to a perceived failure on the part of the government to take enough action to prevent it. Um, uh, I don't think there will be a lack of political will uh, in, inside Pakistan in continuing to oppose the use of drones. Uh, whether or not the government will then escalate its diplomatic initiative to the point of threatening to uh, abandon diplomatic relations I think is extremely doubtful. Um, I mean, the solution lies in Pakistan and the United States coming to a clear understanding of what the position is so that we don't have a situation where the United States believes itself probably with reasonable grounds to continue to have consent from certain sections of the Pakistani establishment, albeit not from the elected government. Um, I mean, at, at, at some point along the way, we have to, uh, uh, Pakistan has to be held responsible for its own position. In other words, you know, it says it isn't consenting. Well, it must be held to that position. Um, so I can't, I mean, I think it would be, it would be, um, I mean, I think the decision is significant. Um, it's significant, um, but not necessarily because it's terribly closely reasoned, but it's significant because it, it reflects the degree of, um, of passion and concern. Um, uh, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily think that, it was, it, uh, that there will be a dramatic change in the approach that the government has adopted. I mean, the government has adopted the only approach so far that I think it can adopt, which is to say we do not consent, we do object, but we are not going to engage in a fight with the Americans. We're not going to t shoot these drones down. We're not going to um, sever all ties on all issues, but we constantly object. And the Americans, they say, uh, need now to listen to us. I mean, I'm not sure what realistically in the world of international relations Pakistan can do more um, other than get its own security under control and bring them within the um, authority of the civilian government, which, you know, to be honest, is not as straightforward in Pakistan as, as in other places. Um, second question. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, first of all, I'm waiting for confirmation as to the existence of signature strikes and what precisely that means. Um, uh, obviously, one of the great difficulties, I mean, I, that, that one of the things that I was saying about the Pashtun tribal groups is that, I mean, if your signature involves um, uh, individuals, large groups of men walking around together with guns on their back of combat age, then, you, you know, if it was as crude as that, then obviously the risk of misidentification is huge. But you'd expect there to have been a greater degree of misidentification and a larger number of civilian casualties than there have been even if it were as crude as that. Um, uh, if it, I mean, the, 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 again, the, the great difficulty with the signature strike issue is that we don't know what the signatures are and probably never can know because as soon as anybody indicates what the signature issues are, then of course um, uh, uh, that would enable those who might be engaged in, 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 in conflict to alter their behavior. So uh, I think that, that that is a very real area of difficulty. And I think everybody recognizes that, that, uh, that, I mean, uh, you know, that signature strikes are the biggest danger uh, uh, in terms of the risk of civilian er uh, casualties and error. And I think, you know, there is a different pattern within, um, within uh, 
Waziristan from the way in which targeting takes place or has taken place in Yemen. Um, not only because the demography and the topography is different, but because um, the nature of the targets are different. Um, so, uh, I mean, we know that there have been instances inside Yemen where vehicles moving between conurbations have, have tended to be a, a, a frequent area of targeting. Um, and there have been tragic areas in which vehicles that contain civilians have been targeted. Now, that may be because it was thought that the vehicle contained somebody else, or it may be because it was engaging in a, vi in a journey at a time which was thought to trigger suspicions. But, I mean, I, I think, again, um, this is an area in which it's possible to imagine nightmares in the absence of some truth. And I think greater clarity on what is, you know, whether such strikes exist and what it means may well dispel some of the more exaggerated myths and risks that are involved. So I think, I think we're having this conversation precisely because we don't have enough facts. And I think that really is a vitally important lesson in all of this. And the third question was, Oh, yeah, well, I don't actually think that the United States justification does depend on the proposition that they're unable to capture individuals. Um, I mean, I think it depends on the proposition that the U.S. is engaged in an armed conflict um, with a non-state uh, non group, with a terrorist organization, and that it is entitled to kill them wherever it finds them. And so um, I don't think that the... Um, uh, uh, the kill or capture analysis that it has to be in a, uh, impossible to capture is essential at all uh, to the US frame of reference. On the other hand, um, we have seen that where a law enforcement paradigm can work, the US is showing itself increasingly willing to adopt a law, a law enforcement paradigm. So, you know, if you have an Al Qaeda suspect who is available, arrested, and can be made available for trial in the US, they're going to be tried now in the US. They're not sent to Guantanamo and they're not necessarily eliminated. I mean, we have some significant individuals uh, potentially facing trial in the United States. But, um, you know, I think the, 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 the choice between do you move into the mountains of, of, of Waziristan with a snatch squad and try to pick off individuals and bring them back to Manhattan and put them on trial here, I mean, I think. Uh, that is not the analysis that the U.S. is is working on. It's working on the analysis that this is a conflict, and in conflict you kill people. But in conflict, people kill you too. We want to thank you for your. Gen We've got a lot more questions, but we are already 20 minutes over. And uh, I want to thank Elizabeth Anderson for the American Society of International Law, who kind of helped arrange this. I really want to thank you, sir, for a brilliant thank you. and interesting uh, presentation. And we await your report with great interest. Thanks. <laughs>